networking for virtual worlds, authoritative server is the topic today. But before we get to that, let me give you some broad information on what this series is going to be, since this is the first video. So the goal here is to uh, solve the current problem in trying to learn how to program a networked virtual world. And that problem is that there are a million ways to do it, and there are a million resources for learning how to do it, but those resources are scattered everywhere. So if you try to Google this stuff, you'll find various forum posts or videos or talks uh, that give you a piece of the picture, but it's a piece of a particular implementation. So trying to piece together the actual implementation that you want to build for your particular thing from all these disparate sources that are talking about disparate things is almost impossible. It's at the very least super obnoxious. So the goal here is to pull out all that information together and to just give you the stuff that you need to know. So what is it that we're going to be aimed at in particular? With this series, I'm going to be going over the basics of networking virtual worlds first, and that's going to be uh, relevant to any sort of networked game or social space or anything that you want to build. Uh, that'll be the first few videos. After those first few videos, I'm going to get to the kind of advanced section, and that'll be talking specifically about the types of things that you need to do a moderately sized single server uh, virtual world for types of games that can handle a little bit of latency. Things like MMORPGs, social games, educational spaces, things like that. So that'll be kind of the setup is uh, basic stuff that applies to any sort of thing, and then deep dive on this particular thing that I have code examples for and everything and can really give you a solid grasp of. I'm not going to be going into super low latency uh, implementations and the types of features that you need for that. I might lightly touch on them just to make sure that you've heard the names of the different concepts, but there are decent resources for trying to learn that. Um, and I mean, the things you need are like lag compensation, which there's a single way to do that pretty much. And by the time you get to that point in your networking implementation, uh, you'll have all the competence that you need to be able to handle it. The other thing that I won't be doing is the other side of it, where you have 5K, 10K plus player counts, where you need a distributed server setup with the same type of justification. Like by the time you get there, you will already uh, know all the basic information that you need. So you'll be able to figure out the rest and there's resources out there for you. So uh, let's get into it. So we're going to be talking about authoritative server from a theoretical perspective right now. These first few videos are all going to be theoretical, and then we're going to get into some practical videos. And those practical videos will uh, maybe look at some different implementations and different engines, maybe source engine, maybe Unreal, I'm not sure yet. Then the actual code examples we're going to be looking at will be from the Amalgam engine. So authoritative servers, the first thing you need to know, uh, pretend you don't know any terms from networking. And that's where we're starting right now. All we know is we have a client and we have a server. And the client's this little blue circle. The server is this blue circle. These lines represent time. Don't worry about it yet. All we know is we have a client and a server and we have a scenario. And that scenario is this star representing a player, pretend everything underneath this line is a play space, this player wants to move to the right. That's it. So the player is interacting with this client, then there's this server, which we know is going to do something, and then on the other side of the server are going to be a bunch of other clients that are trying to see this player move to the right. All right, so very basic example. What we want to do is start from an intuitive approach here. So if you know nothing about networking and you just have this set up, someone tells you, hey, do this thing. 
what would be the most intuitive approach? Well, the client knows where this player is. It knows this player is at a particular position. And let's call this one zero zero, and let's say it wants to move to one zero. So the client knows player is right here, right? And it wants to get that information out to every other client. So we could say the client is going to tell the server uh, the player's entity is at zero zero. Just like that, and it could send that over in a message and the server would receive that at some point. So the server would get this message and it would see, hey, player's entity is at zero, zero. Let's repeat that out to all the other clients and then they'll be able to get that message and display the player's entity at that position. Then at some point, the user interacting with the client is going to press the D key because it's trying to move right. So the user presses the D key and now we need to somehow figure out how do we communicate this movement over to the server? Well, we're already talking just in terms of absolute position of this ent entity. So we might as well just do the same thing and say this player's entity is now at one zero. And I'm skipping some steps here that you'll need to implement if you're building an engine from scratch or something like that. Uh, but they're really outside the scope of this. We're just talking about networking, but the stuff in between here would be uh, this message is a result of a tick being processed and a movement system will look at the client, process its current input state and say, okay, it's at this position. Then in between, these two messages getting sent out, you would have another tick being processed that sees, okay, the input state has changed. We have a right input now. So a movement system is going to move the entity. And then we get to the point where the network update system can say, oh, this entity is at a new position. I'm going to shoot that over to the server. So all that stuff's going on in the background, but we're just looking at the networking here where we can say the D key was pressed and we need to tell the server that the entity is moved. So the server is just going to do the same thing. It sees player's entity is over here now. So it's at one zero, communicates that to all the other clients, and we're good. So the client has uh, locally observed the movement. The client sees the entity at one zero, and all the other clients, the other peers, are also able to observe that movement. So this works totally fine if you're in a scenario where you can completely trust all of the clients. So if you're just making a tiny little thing for some of your friends and you know none of them are going to try to fuck you over by hacking the networking shit, then you're good. You're done. Just do this. But that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get a client that we can actually put into real people's hands and uh, not constantly be shitting ourselves waiting for the day that they start uh, fucking up the sim. So we need to understand basic rule of networking. The client is in the hands of the enemy, right? Like the client's always in the hands of some 10 year old kid that wants to poke around at packets and flip bits and teleport somewhere, right? So that's exactly what you can do here. If you are looking at this network activity, you can find the bytes that make up this one zero position. You can say, well, instead of one zero, let's make it 60,000, right? And now I'm teleporting wherever I want. And the server is just saying, cool, uh, and throwing that over to the rest of the peers. This isn't acceptable for our, uh, for our purposes. So that's how we get to the topic of this one, the authoritative server. The place that we need to start with in our approach is the server is the authority for everything. All actions are made by the server because the, the server verified 
that what was going to happen is cool and it did its own processing to get the output state, right? So the client is no longer allowed to say an entity is at a position. It can't do that anymore. With an authoritative server, the client can only request that something happens. So we're going to go to authoritative server approach and we're gonna clear out all this stuff. So how does that uh, actually manifest in a abstract implementation? Well, the client can only make a request and we could request for the player to be at zero, zero, and then one, zero. We could request that it moves somewhere. But in order to make that request, we need to make a lot of assumptions on the client side. We'd have to assume that our data is good and thus the server would have to trust the client to some extent. The assumptions that we would have to make are, we know where this entity is, and we know how far it can move in a single tick. So the client would have to say, yeah, this thing can move over to here. So after this tick, it's at one zero, and let's shoot that request over to the server. So if we did that, then the request would look something like, uh, It looks something like that. That would be the data that it's trying to shoot over. This isn't great for the reasons that I outlined. Uh, we don't want to say what position the thing is at. So what can we do instead? Well, on the client and the server side, at an engine level, we have some type of state that's holding the current inputs that are active. So like this D key that's pressed down, it's abstracted out to a general, a right movement is being pushed right now, right? So if we did the S key instead, then it would be saying a down movement is being pressed right now. So there's somewhere in the engine where that state is being held and that's on the client and on the server. On both sides, we have an entity that has a current input state. So I'm gonna represent that here as just an array and say, we have an array that is uh, up, left, down, and right. And they're just bools. I'm using zero and one for false and true, just cause it's easier to see than T's and F's. But we have this array out somewhere. We have it on both sides and they might end up out of sync and it's our job to communicate what's going on there. So how could we use this array uh, instead of using this position based request? Well, what we can do is on the client, we can say the user pressed D and we'll move this up here and move this down here to just get the time, right? So the user pressed D and then we want to make some type of request to the server. So the user pressed D, we want to request uh, uh, request to change the inputs. So we want to change the input array. So we want to say uh, up, left, down, all those are the same, but the user press D, which corresponds with right. So we want to request that this entity gets its state updated such that the right input is active. That's what we can actually trust the client to send us just a request, nothing else, no actual state changes. All it can send us is a request to change the state of this entity through the inputs. And then because it's only an input change, the server no longer is looking at processing on the client side being done. The server gets to update the input and then do all of its own processing for the movement. So the server knows how far the entity can move it'll apply that and then tell the client where the entity ended up. So on the server, that's the process we're gonna go through. It's going to uh, accept the input change. So it'll accept it in this case because there's no reason why the inputs shouldn't be able to change. And then uh, what will it do after that? It'll process a movement tick. 
So we can assume that on the server side, the tick is set up something like uh, process networked inputs first, right? So take any networked movements or networked uh, input messages that you've received, process them, verify them, and update entity input state as the first thing. And then right after that, it would process movement for those entities. So it accepted the input change, the player's entity, uh, the version of it that's on the server, now has that write input active. So then when we process the movement tick, the entity moves over to the right, moves over to one, zero. So then after that movement tick is processed, we're gonna get into a network update system. That network update system will see this entity moved, so it'll send the updated state. And it'll do it back to the client because the client doesn't know that any changes occurred. Uh, it didn't do any sort of prediction or anything. It just made a request. So we'll get to send that back to the client saying, here's a new input state, which is the same as the request that was made. And we'll also say uh, the player entity is now at one zero because it processed a movement. And then this same change that it's sending back to the client, it would send over to all the other peers as well. So that's how we handle this type of basic movement scenario. The client only gets to request to change the inputs, the server validates everything, and then tells the client and all other clients where that thing now is. Uh, so in this, we see a problem. And the immediate problem is this client, the user pressed D here, and then there was some amount of time that it took for all of this shit to happen before the actual update occurred on the client side. Like this client entity couldn't replicate this movement until after it received and processed that message. We don't want that long chunk of time. Well, for the game that we're aiming at in the series, we don't want that. That's unacceptable. If you're doing uh, like a turn-based strategy game, then you can do something like this. You can send the request, let the server process it, and wait until the response comes. And that type of thing is called lockstep, uh, where all of the clients in the system send their inputs, server processes it all, and then sends all the output, and then all the clients update, and then they're able to send their next input. So that works for uh, turn-based strategy games. Doesn't really work for anything else. Oh, it works for card games also. If you're doing a card game, you can do that same type of thing. But everything else that needs smooth movement doesn't really work. So we need to add some feature that will allow the client to show the user some amount of smooth movement, even though it's waiting for this whole loop back to happen, right? So that feature is going to be called client-side prediction, and that's what we're going to talk about in the next video. See you then.